I'm going to read you the personal statement for the student who got into Masters of Public Health programs at Yale, UCLA, UC Berkeley, UC Irvine, Emory, and UNC Chapel Hill. This person was also awarded top scholarships at many of the programs they applied for. And what's incredible is that this person never attended my office hours or got personal feedback from me. They just watched my YouTube videos and were able to put together this awesome personal statement. You can see another video with their statement of purpose. And that's the mission of my channel is to provide as many free and affordable resources as possible to help you be successful in applying to grad school, especially for first generation college students and students of color and people who don't have access to be able to get their essays reviewed. So you can find lots of examples of essays on my YouTube channel. Let's dive in. My parents glimpsed the faraway twinkling lights of San Diego for the first time through the darkness of the desert. After years of desperation engendered by endless hunger and violence in their home country, my parents paid human smugglers to guide them across the U.S.-Mexico border in the early 1980s. They eventually settled in Los Angeles and attempted to adapt to a foreign country and its customs. In the years that followed, my older brother and I were born and my parents struggled financially. I still remember hearing my dad's soft groans of pain as he slept on towels sprawled on our broken wooden apartment floor because we could only afford one mattress. Our low social economic status also caused my family to struggle to access quality health care. Over time, our bodies became matching constellations of preventable illness and injuries. For example, I was diagnosed with lead poisoning when I was two years old. Although lead-based paints were banned for residential use in 1978, homes built before still contained toxic traces. Moreover, lead-based paints are most common in older deteriorating homes, which are also often low rent. As a result, these homes are usually occupied by low-income immigrant families, leading to disproportionate lead poisoning rates among communities of color. So this person does some really great storytelling in the way that they're writing. We see that they're demonstrating who they are and where they come from by telling us about their lives. And they're doing a really great job of showing instead of telling. They're not telling me, hey, I'm from a low-income family that has a lack of quality healthcare. They're showing us the ways in which that shows up for them, like with the example of the lead paint. That's a story where they're showing, here's how these things show up in my community. The other thing that they do really well is that I really want you to pay attention to this is that they use very short sentences. All the sentences are like one to two lines long. And one of my biggest complaints or, or feedback when I read people's essays is their sentences are way too long. They're a mouthful. They're like three to four lines long. If you have a sentence that's going over three lines long, cut it down, break it in half, make it more short and concise. And with these shorter sentences, it actually makes the flow of the essay better better. It makes it easier to read. It's less of a mouthful. So that's something to pay attention to in your own writing. Like many other children, I was diagnosed with lead poisoning after living in a string of rundown apartments. Consequently, I experienced deficits in speech, articulation, and production. I also developed a severe lisp that rendered my speech nearly incomprehensible. My parents understood the severity of my poisoning, but as poor Spanish-speaking immigrants, they could not easily access healthcare resources. I did not receive treatment until I was six years old when a shocked elementary school teacher discovered how underdeveloped my speech was and enrolled me in speech therapy. Despite three years of speech therapy, I repeatedly stumbled over the pronunciation of the simplest words. Yet I persevered and worked twice as hard as my peers and was awarded a full tuition scholarship to college. I was academically successful despite the health and housing inequities I faced. However, not every student enduring these inequities experienced the same trajectory. Understanding this made me even more adamant about helping other emerging scholars who endured similar challenges as me. I joined the Berkeley United in Literacy Development Program during my freshman year in college and mentored three elementary students of color at an under-resourced school in Oakland. So here we see an example of something really tough that this person went through, but in the example, we're not left feeling like they are a victim. They're someone who overcame the circumstances in which they faced um, and then went on to be successful in college and then went on to then in turn give back in the communities that they care about. And that's a really great trajectory and narrative arc in this essay. I immediately identified with one of my students, Lily. Because she had a speech impediment, Lily's stutter prevented her from reading as well as her classmates, often discouraging her from reading. To combat this negative self-perception, I shared the many frustrating days I experienced at her age as I wrestled to overcome my speech deficits. 
My stories about succeeding in remedial classes despite my speech delays inspired Lily to practice her reading. After several months of endless hard work, Lily was able to read an entire chapter book aloud. Although her stutter was still present, it was no longer a major detriment to her reading. What's really great in this example is we see how the experiences that this person faced as a child with their own speech progression actually led to them really helping empower another student who was struggling. You know, I'm, I'm rooting for this person as I'm reading this essay. I want them to be successful. I'm really impressed by, you know, how they've overcome these things and, and how they're giving back to their community. In your own essays, in your personal statement, you really want to share from a place of being vulnerable by showing who you are, the things that you've overcome. And that's what makes the readers root for you is when they feel connected to who you are. Oftentimes, um, you know, when I'm reading a personal statement that's not great, it's because um, it's almost like a little bit robotic or a little bit like a resume where it's like, I did this and then I did this and then I did this. Um, but really what the reader is looking for is they want to connect with you. They want to know who you are. They want to know what perspective are you going to bring to the table. And when you tell stories about your life and the things you've been through, that's what helps us connect with you. Think about when you watch um, a movie. Every movie has something that's called like a hero's journey. You're watching um, the person go through something hard and overcome some struggle and then, you know, hopefully have a, a happy ending at the end. No one wants to watch a movie where everything's just going great and perfect for the person the whole time because that's boring. Um, and so, you know, when you're writing a personal statement, you can borrow um, that technique and that narrative arc of really trying to find what is your hero's journey? How have you journeyed in and in out of different experiences to come to the place you are at now to do the thing that you want to do. And we see in this example that this person is bringing it back to um, public health with this example of lead poisoning um, and how it's the environmental conditions of lead poisoning um, that led to the struggles that they had to overcome. And that brings them back to why they care about doing public health work and changing these kinds of societal conditions for others. On my final day as a literacy tutor, I met Lily's grandparents, whom she lived with full time. Their eyes welled with tears as they thanked me for my commitment to helping Lily. In hushed pain whispers, they confided that they barely completed elementary school in their native country. Consequently, they could not read books at home with Lily to help her with her stutter. As I watched them drive away, I remembered my parents who did everything they could to provide me with the best academic opportunities. I want to point out a really great writing technique that they used in this paragraph where they mention what the grandparents said to them, where they say in hush pain whispers, they confided that they barely completed elementary school. This is a really great technique where you describe what happened in a situation. This is um, how you do showing instead of telling, you know, you can go into some uh, he said, she said, they said, and, and tell us like what happened, what unfolded in that situation. And that's a good way to do some storytelling. After I graduated from college, I started a job at a national nonprofit that focuses on advancing educational equity with disadvantaged communities. I worked directly with various under-resourced schools in the San Fernando Valley where I grew up. It was during a visit to one of these schools that I met Pablo, a witty second grader with so much unfettered brilliance who also happened to have a list. Like me, he had been diagnosed with lead poisoning after living in dilapidated low rent housing. When I learned this, I reeled back in shock. 20 years after my diagnosis, yet another low income child of color was inflicted with the same preventable condition as me because structural inequities continue to impact the health of disadvantaged communities. After critically assessing my medical challenges and those of other children like Lily and Pablo, I can see clearly the systemic barriers that keep low income communities of color entrapped in an ongoing cycle of health distress. I soon began to question the efforts promoting health equity among these communities. How are these efforts genuinely inclusive of the unique needs of these communities? Do health education materials and programs account for the varying education levels of caregivers like Lily's grandparents? Is a multifaceted approach to public health prioritized one that considers the interconnected influence of, of social health determinants to learn how social economic status affects the health of children like Pablo? 
My commitment to finding answers to these questions has led me to seek a career in public health. Here we see the writer really coming back to public health and the way they see and view public health and their interest in it. So they're not just telling us about their life just to tell us about their life, they're telling us about their life in a way that brings them back to why public health? Why do they want to get a master's in public health? This is also a really great technique you can borrow um, in your own writing is highlighting what are questions you have? What are the things that you care about? And you this method of leaving these open-ended questions really show this is the way you think. This is the perspective that you're bringing. And it's a great technique you can use in your own essays. I feel an urgency to collaborate with community-based organizations. I aim to implement and evaluate culturally sensitive healthcare programs to ensure low-income communities of color access resources that address public health dangers like lead poisoning. The Health and Social Behavior Program at UC Berkeley is positioned to train me as a health equity advocate to do this work. By engaging with the program's social justice-oriented curriculum, I'm confident that I will learn how to practice a cross-cultural perspective to the field and help historically marginalized communities like mine receive the education and tools needed to lead healthier lives. So this is a great personal statement. They end it with coming back to why the program, why they want to do public health, and you see that journey that they went through and what they experienced in their life and how that journey has led them to public health and where they're at now. Something else I want to point out about this essay is if you go to the other video of their statement of purpose, you can see that these two essays complement each other really well. And you can see that the personal statement is not a reiteration of what we already heard in the statement of purpose. Here, it's a lot of brand new information that's not even mentioned in the statement of purpose. And sometimes I see um, personal statements and statement of purposes where they kind of overlap a lot and they're maybe giving examples of the same project where one they're talking a little bit more on the personal side and the other one they're talking more on the work experience. It's better if you actually diversify what's in each of these essays because each essay should show a different side of you, a different angle of you, and it's an opportunity to expand on the skills and the experiences you have. In the person's other essay, they were talking primarily about maternal and child health and all their experiences working on maternal and child health. And then in this essay, we see them talking about literacy, completely different than the first essay, but we see how they, the work that they did as a tutor working with these students was really impactful to them and really a motivator for why they wanna to continue to do this kind of work and prevent these kinds of issues um, in the first place from happening and why that brings them to public health. So when you're writing your personal statement, you really wanna make sure it's complementary to the statement of purpose that is not repetitive of the statement of purpose. You can download my sample essays that are linked in the description below. You can also come to my office hours if you want to get feedback on your essays.